started. Good morning and welcome back. I hope the first week of the term has been going well for you so far. Um, so glad to see folks returning. Um, I know we have a couple of new faces today. So if we have some folks who are here for the first time, I do want to direct you to a couple of resources to help you out. Um, so you'll notice uh, before each class meeting, I upload these slides to Canvas. This is designed to help you and ease the process of taking notes. You should still take notes, but um, you don't have to get things down word for word and then focus on the reactions, the things you're learning over the course of these issues being discussed. Uh, this is also designed to help people, including folks who might be sitting further the back or need a screen reader accessibility to help you as you're working through that. And also designed to help folks as you're working through some of the prompts and activities we'll be doing in the class too. And then before the next class meeting, I will upload a video uh, that is a recording of that previous class meeting. So if you were absent, sick, unable to come to class, uh, using the video recording from the previous class meeting is a great way to catch up on things that you might have missed. So uh, those resources are available for you. And as a reminder, uh, the first quiz, which is Open Note and Open Book, is due by this Sunday. Um, the textbook, uh, Stuart textbook, is available as a PDF for you to access for free during the first week of the term after the first week. Um, then uh, the textbook is uh, something that you'll need to purchase. As mentioned, right, you can access the textbook. Um, either through the EOU bookstore or online. Um, the link to access that is right here. All right. So as a quick recap of last class, uh, during our first class meeting, we had the chance for folks to introduce ourselves. Uh, we had people interview each other and then share uh, some of the things that we learned about each other through that process of interviewing. We'll take more time in the class to do group activities to get to know each other better. And so uh, if you don't know a lot of names in that class, uh, that's okay. We'll figure that out over time. Uh, we also talked a little bit about the importance of developing interview skills, right? Um, consistently, uh, employers such as Indeed uh, that host and circulate uh, job ads, right? Cite verbal communication skills as the most important thing that they're looking for from a good interview. Right? Uh, interviews are things we're going to have to do over the course of our lives. They can be incredibly high stakes, like preparing for our careers, but also things that we do if we're gathering research, research, right? We're doing an interview type project, if we're trying to seek out data and other information. So it's a good thing for us to learn and develop. And this class is exploring both sides of the equation. What does it mean to prepare for an interview, to ask questions, to research candidates ahead of time? And what does it mean to be a prepared and effective interviewee who can answer questions effectively? We also went over the syllabus and course expectations as well. Um, I encourage you to review those ahead of this week's quiz. Any questions about anything related to this class, anything we talked about last class, or anything else before we get started today? Okay. If questions do come up at any point, please let me know, um, and I'm happy to go over and discuss anything that might come up. You're also welcome to send me an email, including if you need to check the course. Is there anybody here face-to-face uh, -face for the first time today? All right, so we got a few faces. Um, so as I mentioned coming in, I encourage all of you who are here for the first time to review the recording from Monday's class as well as the slides. Take a look at the syllabus. And you're welcome to meet with me in office hours or discuss through email if you have any questions you need to catch up. So uh, let's have our new folks here introduce themselves to the class. Uh, so I'd like you to share your name, uh, your major, or what you're thinking about for your major, um, and something that you might have done over the course of spring break. Start over here. Uh, my name is Garrett Hewitt. Uh, major I'm considering is computer science, and I worked on my cabin with my dad over spring break. Cabin, that's awesome. Uh, whereabouts? Uh, it's over in Deer Lake, over sure. by Spokane, kind of. Okay, yeah. We have a lot of folks here, uh, kind of from Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, a uh, variety of places uh, throughout the Northwest and beyond. So great to meet you and have you in the class. Okay, who else is here for the first time? Hi. 
I'm Blake. I'm a business major and I'm the over screen grade. Uh, I work with my grand parents a lot. Okay. Awesome. And whereabouts is that? Over by Ben. Okay. Yeah. Um, I go over to Ben around the Cascade Lakes area every summer and it's beautiful out there. So, welcome. Uh, glad to have you here. And then I believe we have a new face over here. Hi. Uh, yeah, watch anything good? All right, which can or can't be good, depending on what you're talking about, depending on which trilogy, I guess. Uh, very cool. I watch a lot of like trash reality TV, so I'm not going to judge. Anyone else here with this time? And then we have Angela who's joining us over Zoom. Angela, are you here today? Yeah, I'm here. Um, from Angela, who is uh, trying to join uh, from far away. Uh, so uh, thank you all. Um, glad to have you here. And uh, for everybody else, glad to have you all back. Okay, so um, I wanted to take some time today to talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty of what defines an interview, some of the categories and types of interviews. And we'll be doing a group activity in this class that allows us to explore and better understand different types of interviews effectively. Right. Uh, this first week is an opportunity to introduce ourselves to interviewing, why it matters, why it's important, how it works, and how we can do interviews effectively before we dive into some of the interview assignments that we'll be doing in the class. So um, I'll ask for a couple of volunteers. And yes, I will hold an awkward silence as long as possible until I get a response. So um, in your own words, what is an interview? You might consider an example of an interview. Um, a type of interview. Uh, when you hear the word interview, what comes to mind? What do you expect? Yes. Um, I think of like someone, um, say, I guess I have to use interview, but like someone kind of questioning someone and just pretty much asking them like what they do and uh, how they are. Mm -hmm. Hard to define an interview without getting like topological or circular, right? Including the word in the definition because it's so great. An interview um, involves the use of questioning for sure. That is a crucial component. Um, it involves gathering information. Other things that we might consider in defining an interview or things we'd like to add to this definition. Yeah, I feel like it's an evaluation of your character. Okay, right. So we communicate, right, to learn about each other, to understand each other. Um, interviews are a method of evaluating, like, a candidate for a job or to better understand if the group organization is one that you would intend to work for. Sure. Um, what would be an example of a type of interview? We've talked a little bit about an employment interview. Um, what are other types of interviews? Yeah, right. So um, if you are working with a counselor or expert in mental health, perhaps they are interviewing to get to know and understand your issues or concerns, or they might use interviews as a way of addressing or dealing with the topic. In healthcare, right, uh, oftentimes the use of interview structure and questioning is designed to help um, understand the purpose and goals here, right? It's meant to troubleshoot and help people work together. So those are a couple of types of examples. And we'll break those down in a little bit more detail a little bit later today. So there are a few things that I think are important as you're definitionally understanding what an interview is, right? I think it's very important in the first week of a class to make sure we know what is in the class's title as a group. Uh, since this class is an interviewing, um, we can start by defining interviewing as the idea of it being dyadic. Right, an interview is involving a dyad. Um, so there's a really important distinction, and spoiler alert, this is one of the questions on the quiz. So um, this is a 3D if you are following along. So an interview can involve more than two people, right? But it can only involve two parties. You can think about a party as a group or entity or individual who is representing something. So I'll give you one example. Right. You can do an interview where perhaps um, you are a doctor who's interviewing a patient, right? The doctor is one party, they're the provider, uh, the patient is the other party who is receiving the help uh, from that doctor, right? 
You have two parties. But another example of an interview involving two parties might be um, a hiring or search committee, right? That might involve multiple people who are interviewing a single job candidate, right? Uh, in this way, you have two parties, one who's representing uh, the hiring institution, right? Who is uh, questioning and maybe alternating questions between people on the committee and the person who is receiving um, and responding to those questions, right? This is important because if you have that committee or group, and then you have like two people who are being questioned at the same time, that would no longer be considered an interview, right? That uh, would be more than two parties. Obviously, uh, one party is not an interview either. If you are just talking to yourself, right, you're maybe questioning and reflecting, but you're not interviewing yourself. Or if you are doing a hiring committee related interview and both of you um, are just talking to each other and you're both on the committee, right? That wouldn't be an interview either. So two people or more who are coming from two different interests or goals or perspectives, right? Uh, so two parties is an important element for us to consider in interviewing. If it's more than two, right? That starts to get into a larger conversation. Um, sometimes you have people who are cycled in and out, right? You're hiring candidates, you're bringing people in, you're bringing people out. That would be an interview, right? But that's because um, you don't have more than two parties at the same time. So uh, interviews are interactional, right? What makes interviews particularly important is their emphasis on the way that they dynamically play out. If you've taken a class like interpersonal communication or communication related course, what you know is that communication, what makes communication special is the way that it lays out very differently than what we might expect going in. You're talking to a friend and next thing you know, you're having like a several hours long conversation about, um, you know, what the best type of snack to eat is. Um, oftentimes we go into conversations and communication with other people uh, with a very different outcome than what we would have expected going in. So the ability of communication to be dynamic, to play out differently compared to our expectations, that's something that we see translate to an interview as well. We come in with a set of questions or expectations, but we're really looking for conversation. We're looking for the ability to form a connection. And oftentimes what makes interviews the most engaging is the use of follow-up questions, right? If you were ever watching uh, an interview, uh, for example, there is a really popular YouTube series uh, called Hot Ones, right? Where you have a lot of famous celebrities who are like eating progressively spicy hot wings and answering interview questions. If every interview was structured the same way, where somebody was like asking the exact same set of questions over and over and receiving just a one-to-one -one response, that'd be incredibly boring, right? Or if you've seen uh, Between Two Ferns with, I'm gonna try it, uh, Zach Galifianakis, I think you got it, right? That's an interview where the whole point is that he's off asking incredibly awkward and uncomfortable questions. So part of the joy that we experience from interviewing is that it's not just the staccato script of questioning, receiving a response and so forth. Sometimes you do have to follow those expectations, but what makes interviewing neat is this collaborative interactional environment where two people or more are working together uh, and engaging with each other. At least one person in the group has to have a predetermined and serious purpose, right? In other words, um, we can assume in a lot of situations, like a job interview, that both people care, that both people are coming in prepared, uh, the interviewer is prepared with a set of questions or expectations. The interviewee is prepared because they've done some research into the group that is going to be actually hiring them. And as a result of that, they both put in that effort. However, an interview can also involve one group being prepared and one group not. Uh, I have an extended family member who, uh, whose name will not be named. And uh, this person is very skilled in a lot of areas, including technology and computers, um, and uh, was really seeking out a job. Um, and was very qualified, got asked to interview at a lot of different places, and was not getting jobs. And so we were checking in and we were like, well, what's going on? How is the interview process going? Um, and we were kind of discussing how that person was interviewing. And um, so we were like, okay, so if you receive a question like, um, you know, why do you want this job? Uh, this person said, oh, well, I always say money. We're like, what? Well, when somebody asks why I want the job, I just say, I want more money. I want a job that pays me more. And I say that when I'm being interviewed. And we're like, hang on. Well, that's why you're not getting the jobs, right? If your response is, I want money, 
response is not about the topics or issues or qualifications that you find yourself aligning with, well, I would explain a few things, right? So there are some interviews where you have one group or a population that's prepared, one that's not, um, and that can be something you learn through the interview process. So do not answer why you want this job with money. <laughs> that is not uh, going to be a way that you land a job. And as mentioned, right, it's involving asking and answering questions. Questions are in many ways the backbone of an effective interview and our ability to not only prepare good questions, understand the types and purposes of questions, but also use things such as follow-up questions as a crucial way to interview effectively too. So interpersonal communication is an important element of the interview process. How many folks have taken interpersonal communication? Okay, so number of you. If you haven't, that's fine. Uh, interpersonal communication is generally referring to communication between two people, right? It's the meaningful exchange of information, of symbols, of ideas that convey reality between uh, typically a group of two. And interpersonal communication um, are, of course, the main types that we see in an interview. We might see group communication if we have one party that's a bit larger. Uh, but generally speaking, interpersonal communication is more intimate, right? It's you really talking and getting to know another person. Um, you know, we use verbal and nonverbal communication to indicate our comfort, right? Next time you talk to a close friend or family member, see how close you're standing to them relative to speaking to a very casual acquaintance. You'll notice the difference in terms of how you nonverbally express yourself. Interpersonal communication can also be casual, right? We build comfort over time with people. Maybe you just start talking to your roommate as you're folding clothes, doing the laundry. Um, interpersonal communication can be distant, right? It can happen across mediums. Um, for instance, perhaps you are interviewing for a position that's on the other side of the country. Um, interpersonal communication can be formal and also be designed to fulfill function. In other words, we communicate to fulfill a variety of different needs. Whether they're basic survival and human needs, I'm hungry, I need to get some food, can we stop at the next exit? Or whether they're meant to convey things such as social and belonging needs. We really value having you in this group um, or um, talking about your goals, dreams, and hopes. Sometimes we get there in that interview too. We're asking questions that are deeply meaningful. As we interact with people, right, we build a history with them. In other words, um, our process of interacting and relating to people in a group allows us to build meaningful relationships that inform our future uh, interactions with them. You have a good friend, oftentimes, like a childhood friend, like in high school, you have the ability to just pick up where you left off with them because you had so much communication and contact with them, um, and that history kind of comes flooding back. Or uh, perhaps you interviewed with somebody for a job, you got the job, and the interview was a way of initiating your professional relationship with them. You use that as a starting point for future discussion, collaboration, and work with them. So interpersonal communication is an important step here. The two-way communication we have with other people is how interviews play out. In terms of our interactions, right, generally speaking, um, we have three different levels, right? At the first level, we generally talk in an interview about safe, non-controversial, and basic topics. Uh, so things such as your name, where you're from, and so forth. During last class, when we had folks introduce themselves, we used those non-confrontational topics as a way of starting to get to know each other better, right? If we dig a little bit deeper in the second level, um, this is relating to things such as attitudes, beliefs, and values. So maybe that gets into your personal opinions about um, sports, about social and political related issues, right? This gets more at some of the things that are important and matter to you. Uh, and that can be a little bit more controversial because not everybody is going to agree with or resonate with the beliefs and ideas that you have. So over the course of an interview, you're providing a way to see if you're able to relate to each other and more safely speak to those things. Are your values and beliefs in alignment? Do you share um, those concerns uh, with the other group? And then at the third level, this is something we see in a lot of counseling and healthcare settings, right? This is relating to a very deep uh, sharing of personal beliefs and self-disclosure, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your anxieties, your fear, right? That's something that we don't normally see in a lot of interviews, but depending upon the context, Situation, it might be considered appropriate to do so. 
right? So one thing that we want to think about is if you're preparing to interview somebody, right? We're not going to ask them to share their childhood trauma. That was your first interview question. Um, I would immediately leave the meeting, right? Um, that would not be appropriate, um, but it is a good idea for us to think about what data we're trying to gain from the interview and what level is appropriate, right? Most interviews are going to be at these two. A level one interview is typically something that you can easily access through social media or LinkedIn, right? Um, so generally from an interview, it's a good way to start things off, but it's not really digging in and giving you things that will let you make an informed decision about a topic, right? Uh, generally speaking, you're wanting to get to that second level, right? Say, say for example, um, you are working um, here at EOU and you're trying to hire somebody who is going to work and teach classes at EOU, right? We're going through that process right now. If we're doing that, we want to make sure we have somebody whose beliefs and attitudes and values are aligned with what we do here, right? We want to make sure that there's somebody who's able to support and work with us effectively. And we have to get to that second level to do that. It's not something you easily get by just doing a basic search online. By the way, whenever you find yourself um, interviewing, being considered for jobs and all of that, you um, might want to do a Google search of yourself and just make sure that your activity and what's visibly uh, seen on social media is appropriate and aligned to the impression that you want to give because um, consistently people will search online. And if your like profile photo is you holding the beer, uh, that is probably not going to create a great impression in terms of your public persona to people who are looking you up. So there's a variety of different problems when it comes to the process of interacting with each other verbally, right? Uh, one of them is the idea of multiple meetings. Uh, so uh, meetings to words. So if somebody were to say beer, right? Are they referring to the animal or are they meaning it as a term of endearment or are they meaning it as a salutation in an email? Sometimes, right? Um, there can be a big disparity in how we understand each other's meaning behind words that can impact the interview process. Um, I mentioned that I coach speech and debate. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, we were preparing students uh, for a debate that was discussing the topic of visas, right? In the context of immigration of granting individual visas. However, um, there were some students who misinterpreted and thought that the debate was about whether or not to give people credit cards, right? So they made their whole case and their whole debate about how we should offer every immigrant in the United States a visa credit card. And they won the debate, but uh, did not win it the right way. So um, understanding uh, multiple meetings, making sure you're resolving ambiguities and left Clarity in debate is in, in uh, our communication with each other is important, right? There are no bad questions. Um, so our ability to ask questions helps us to show our understanding of material. Also, words that sound alike. Um, another important consideration here is connotation, right? So connotation referring to the cultural attitudes and beliefs that we attach to a word that go beyond a specific meaning, right? Um, so I've been having a lot of fun trying to better understand uh, how emojis are used generationally because a lot of Gen Z folks are using them in more ironic contexts, right? Uh, they're posting like the death emoji because um, they think something's really funny and uh, is like, oh, I'm, oh, gee, I'm dead, right? So learning those things and connotations is important. Jargon is specialized language, right? We can lose uh, sight of each other if people are using language and terminology we don't understand. For example, if somebody is using an abbreviation or acronym that other people don't know, that's on an interviewer to explain that process, but also on an interviewee to make sure that they understand that jargon. Slang is very informal uh, language, right? So if somebody were to ask you, hey, uh, would you like to uh, take this job? And your answer is bet, then uh, probably not an appropriate response to that interview, right? Euphemisms. Um, so um, we have a lot of euphemisms for death and sex, um, right? I'm not going to go over all of those, but we oftentimes like to use words to stand in for other words or phrases, like using terms such as passed away um, or common examples of how we might phrase uh, something or beat around the bush when it's talk. Naming. Um, how do we name or, or utilize names, right? There's a particular issue where uh, a lot of People of color disproportionately, um, their names are not being pronounced or represented accurately. 
um, and the usage of power words, right, or very charged language, like um, you are going to uh, absolutely throttle the competition, right, or using language that is very, um, that oftentimes presents a front, is something people will do in a lot of interviews, particularly if they're trying to create a great impression, right? We demolish the competition. The next time you look at a press release, uh, for example, of a sports team that has done really well, uh, you'll probably notice a lot of power words being used to really sell the success of the group. So over the course of communication, right, we develop uh, competence and understanding with one another. We figure out similarities between people in a group. We create a more inclusive environment where people uh, feel like they understand and trust each other. We might develop affection, right, which can be platonic, um, and our ability to like and respect others. We also know that relational competence in our relationships might be related to control. Perhaps you're being interviewed by somebody who is your supervisor, or perhaps a health provider is interviewing you because um, they want to take on a role as your primary care physician. And the idea of trust is something that becomes developed in that process too. We want to get to level two or level three, that really deep disclosure. That's something that we need to have through the use of prolonged trust. Right? You're not going to share um, some of the biggest aspirations or concerns with the therapist until you feel like you've developed some level of rapport and comfort with them. So in that process, right, there are challenges, confusion, hurdles, and issues that we'll walk through. So perhaps we're trying to gather information like a survey, and we feel like some anxiety that people are sharing about their experiences. I've encountered this when doing the interviews for research. Right, People are not always the most excited to talk about uh, really personal issues related to their health. So figuring out how to develop trust with one another is an important way that we can develop a good interview, right? Because the better trust and the closer relationships that you have with people in the interview process, the more information you're going to gain, the more information you're able to share, and the better impression you're leaving uh, through that entire interview. So in this way, um, there are a few different types of interviews we can think about. Uh, we can think about this in a very broad sense in terms of what the goals and purpose of the interview might be. In an information gathering interview, we're using questions and conversation to get insights about a person, right? So for instance, figuring out if this candidate would be a good fit for a job. Perhaps we're interviewing somebody uh, who uh, served in World War II. What was that experience like? So we are trying to seek out information about the other party. And that's a two-way street, right? Oftentimes, the other person is trying to learn a thing or two about you. Yes, you want a job, but you also want to figure out if you enjoy the job. So you might have some questions. Information giving interviews are the other end, where you already have the information, but the interview is a way of sharing and conveying that information to other people. A really good example of this is providing a training or coaching, right? You're using questions to guide them through the process. Perhaps you've taken on a new internship or job, right? And a coach or mentor is asking questions to help you make sure that you understand fully what's going on. Then we have a focus group, right? So a focus group is a larger set of people, generally about six to eight, who are going to meet to discuss a topic or issue um, that is brought to them. So this is really, really commonly used in a lot of corporations, right? So maybe, um, you know, uh, Pepsi-Cola is um, ditching Sierra Mist. They have this new thing. I forget what it's called, but it's, oh, it's like Starry as a new like um, soda that they're doing, right? So they probably used a lot of focus groups to get to that new soda. They're asking people about the name. They're asking people about the taste, right? Focus groups are a way of bringing a group of people together to hash it out and discuss an issue. This is still two parties. It's still considered an interview, right? Because the participants in the focus group um, are representing the party, uh, the interested people um, who are being asked to respond to the prompt. So what do you all think of this new soda? Is, is it good? Should we market it? How should we market it, right? That would be something you present to the focus group being this larger party. We'll talk a lot about questions over the course of this class, the ability to ask and answer questions effectively. Um, but um, I think it's a good idea to first recognize that they can take on two different styles, right? We can use questions in a much more directed way where we're presenting them in a very linear way. We're asking everybody very similar questions. Um, and then we also have what are considered to be non-directed. 
These are much more open-ended questions. They're designed for people to share in a much more qualitative way about their experiences. And we're going to see a lot more variation in the types of responses that we get. So we'll talk a little bit more in this class about the appropriateness of these different types and when and how we might use them. Another issue to consider here is the modality, right? The modality being the way that the interview is conducted. How many people have ever been asked to complete an interview uh, over the phone? Perhaps something like a Gallup poll uh, or maybe a robocall or customer satisfaction survey or something similar. Seeing a lot of people nodding, right? So a lot of people have received these types of calls. They can be really obnoxious. Um, I keep getting asked about my opinions on political candidates that are not even in my district. Um, so that can be a challenge, right, is uh, dealing with interviews that involve reaching people from a variety of different experiences and also scams, right? Uh, how many people have ever received a scam call? Yeah, so a lot of you. Um, those are really going around the EOU too. Um, I even got one that was supposedly from EOU's president asking me to um, honor our staff by providing them gift cards. Hmm, uh, that doesn't sound fishy. So generally speaking, right, face-to-face -face interviews are generally preferred. Uh, they're an opportunity to engage with people in a three-dimensional space. They're an opportunity to really pay attention to our feedback and communication between people. But it can be hard to get people in the same room, especially if uh, people are coming from a larger distance. Telephone interviews, right? They're low cost. They're commonly used, but they can oftentimes be a nuisance, right? You're doing a scam. You're doing a call. Um, you don't feel connected to the results. Um, you don't really feel like you care, right? Um, video such as Skype has become more common. It was a common practice where early on in an interview, it might be over the phone or it might be through Skype. And maybe later on in the process, they bring you in face to face um, as a way of screening candidates and getting people to that final step, right? Um, so things such as Skype and Zoom can be useful because they allow people to do more nonverbal communication, such as gesturing, eye contact, and so on. Um, but there's still that limit there, right? We definitely felt that in the context of COVID, where a lot of things were moved remote, where people didn't feel like they were able to fully connect to each other. Um, at the end of the day, right, you're this two-dimensional rectangle. Your brain is working extra hard to understand how nonverbal communication is happening in this small two-dimensional space, which is part of why uh, virtual meetings can be pretty exhausting. So that can be an issue too. And email is generally the last choice because typically you're not getting that dynamic engagement uh, because you send it out, you get a response, but you're not allowing you to follow up questions uh, and really uh, the dynamic stuff in interview invites. So we'll talk a little bit more about virtual interviews and ways of doing virtual interviews effectively. Um, but some of them being text and chat, making sure that you've got uh, good lighting, um, managing interruptions, like if you've got a pet, put them in the other room, uh, looking at the camera rather than looking at the like um, box that has yourself, um, looking at and accounting for lag, being in a place that's stable and has good internet, um, dressing in a way that's appropriate, right? There's the common attire uh, we saw under COVID, which people had like a very professional top hat, and then we're wearing like pajama pants. Um, directness and brevity is important, right? Especially in interviews. Um, if you are asking uh, questions, right, don't let the interviewee wander. It's very easy in virtual interviews for people to get off track. Um, managing time, and we'll talk about this later in the class too, is really important. You typically have limited time to conduct the interview. you got to get the information that you can over that. Um, and you might use recordings uh, as a way of making sure that you can go back through information. And instructions ahead of time are really important, too, so that people understand uh, what they need to do. So what I'm going to be asking you to do is take a little bit of time uh, to examine uh, one of four different types of interview categories. So the textbook, uh, including the PDF, uh, begins on page 50, or um, you're welcome to do some searching on your own about these types of interviews. So in each of the four groups, what I'll be asking you to do is to take a look at and be prepared to share um, the goals of this type of interview, how this type of interview would be conducted, how one could prepare for this type of interview, and the types of questions that would be asked in this type of interview, right? Um, these uh, types being selection, 
performance, persuasive, and counseling. So I'm going to be numbering you all off from one to four and asking you to move uh, to your groups in just a minute. So we'll start here with her. One, two, three, four. 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 One, two, three. Okay. So if you are a one, uh, we over here on this side, you are working on a selection interview. If you're a two, you should be in the middle on a performance interview. If you are a three, be up here in this front corner on persuasive, and then a four in this back corner on a counseling interview. Device. Remember, this is also available in the week one PDF. So if you're working through, right, you can just click here and it'll also display uh, some of the information about these types of interviews too. And you're also welcome to do something as simple as a Google search to look up more information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Give you a few more minutes and ask one person to share for each group. How are groups doing? Uh, any groups who would like some additional time? Okay, just a couple more minutes. You might just remind each other as to your names and your groups too, so we're still getting to know each other. And finish your first thought or idea. Have somebody ready to share for your group. Okay. So let's come back together um, and let's have each group share uh, what they learned about this type of interview. So let's start over here with the selection interview. Uh, 
uh, so we have selection review for this. Uh, it's a it's an open free flowing uh, interview. Uh, it's used to determine if you are suitable for a specific job. The goal here is to find some of the higher bidders for the group of companies. Uh, it's normally the final step in an interviewing process. Uh, they use it because there's greater variety, it's more interaction, uh, less structural in an interviewer uh, competition. And it says here that one way to prepare for it is that you're going to take a photo. Yeah. So this is a good way of thinking about this type of interview. Um, as you've mentioned, right, it's oftentimes a final or later step in the process. If somebody has submitted an application, um, they've already considered right, the position, but the interview is a way of um, working for that. A lot of different steps. Uh, the selection interview generally comes for the end. How about the performance interview? So these are the goals of the performance interview for the interviewer is to see and assess the performance and the quality of people that might be working for them. Mm -hmm. For the interviewee is to properly represent their skills and qualities. Mm -hmm. um, these of this would occur routinely or annually in like job situations and or like when the employees first train for the job to make sure they're doing the job right. And then the interviewer will prepare for this by clearly setting standards for skill abilities and benchmarks for the interviewee and figure out how to correct any shortcomings that they find for the performance. And then for the interviewee is to observe their own habits and productivity on the job so that they can represent that to the uh, employer. And then some examples of questions would be like, what are your expectations of tasks? How long does it take you to do tasks? How would you assess your own work? And how would you improve? Excellent. Right. So oftentimes, like an annual performance review is a context where we see this kind of interview come up. And oftentimes it is the next step after a selection interview, once we have a candidate who is uh, hired and working in the position. How about persuasive? So our people for the persuasive interview, uh, the goal of this type of interview is for the interviewer to persuade the interviewee to act a certain way on a certain topic. Um, it's used mainly in situations of sales, political candidates, attorneys, professors, and students. Um, for preparation, both parties need to come in with the mindset of being honest, fair, skeptical, thoughtful, and deliberate, open-minded, and responsive. And then the kinds of questions that are asked are typically open-ended but opinionated questions. So, like, what is your opinion on this political candidate? Like, why do you think that way? Try to persuade. Yeah. How many of you were approached by someone who recruited you to come to EOU? <laughs> Maybe for like team, like athletics, right? That'd be an example here, right? Trying to get people toward a goal or position and using questions as a means of directing people toward an outcome or a thing we want them to do. And then uh, counseling interviews. Uh, we said that for the goals, uh, it's to gain trust and get it on the ground uh -huh. uh, from level one to three, create a personal relationship so that we can take it. We said for the um, we the type of interviews we conducted. Uh, we said for like mental health counseling, school counseling, uh, doctor's appointments, uh, sports counseling, and sometimes like field parent issues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the preparation, we said that uh, we can do research on the counselor. I guess to see like they're highly recommended um, and obviously how they apply to your issue. And then uh, you kind of want to reflect on what they say. I mm -hmm. guess that's Um, and then for the questions, uh, we take it, it kind of depends on like why you're there, mm -hmm. but uh, like kind of like how are you feeling, what, what's causing this issue, icebreaker to try and get, get the feeling better, and uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. So when we hear counseling, we might think like therapist, which is one example, right? But counseling can also be with regard to navigating or dealing with injury, right? You see the diagnosis, how do you want to deal with that? Might also be something such as career counseling or coaching, right? What are your career or professional goals? By the way, um, you might have noticed uh, as we were going around, Career Expo is today. So if you're interested in that and exploring that, um, I definitely recommend checking that out. You probably received a couple emails about that. Uh, but these four categories are ones we'll be exploring and doing in this class, right? And I wanted to highlight them to have us explore some of the differences in terms of the purpose, the goals, the kinds of questions that we might see 
types of responses and different ways of preparing, right? These interviews are designed to do very different things and achieve very different goals. Um, and uh, the ability to prepare and come into our communication with those goals aligned is an important way to conduct interviews successfully. So to wrap up for today, we talked a little bit about interviewing in terms of their goals, styles, and modality, um, and some of the ways in which you can see these differences across uh, types of interviews. You're welcome to hang on to uh, the notes and information that you took today so that you can read that for yourself. I do not need you to turn that in. Uh, but on Friday, we'll be discussing structure, organization, and uh, some of the nuts and bolts of conducting an interview. Have a great rest of your morning. Enjoy the sunshine, and I'll see you again on Friday.